Oh, hey. I asked you if you knew anything. You didn't tell me you were representing the lead suspect. I didn't know it at the time. I was with my now fiance, and we were going out for uh, my birthday, for a birthday dinner. Yeah, on the street in Venice in LA. It was my agent and manager calling to tell me um, that I'd gotten the part, and I was screaming and crying in public, <laughs> makeup everywhere. Ray is beautiful, smart, funny, tough, and just like Kim is all those things. Kim's maybe less funny. People think I think she's kind of cold. I think she is kind of cold, the character. But I think it's out of protecting herself. You know, she's a woman in a high-powered man's world. I feel like she has a real inner life that we maybe haven't discovered all of it yet, but you can see that it exists. Listen, I agree that Chuck needs help, and maybe it's the right thing to do, but you can't do it like this. It's a nice welcome change from a lot of female characters that can just be a function of your male lead. Um, that was something that we very much did not want. The cease and desist is just the beginning. The next step is an injunction. You can't win this fight. She does seem to show a softer side to Jimmy. I think that they're very compatible. They're friends. I love playing the relationship between Kim and Jimmy because it is not black and white. Even your lousy days are more interesting than my good ones. Yeah, well, we should definitely do something about that. I especially love writing for Kim because, you know, I know, you know the, the woman on the show, but at the same time, she's such a fun character to write for. And her and Jimmy together, those are my favorite scenes when I get to write for both of them. They have a shorthand. There's a lot of stuff going on between the lines. And so I love watching those scenes and writing those scenes. This is way better than the other one. You think? Uh, yeah, who goes in here? Because I'd be all up in here if I were you. <laughs> that scene was amazing to play because you see the ease of their friendship and that's so much fun to play that chemistry. It's a corner office. You gotta go with the corner office. I was saving it for someone. Who? Well, my partner. Your partner? Who's... <sighs> who would that be? And I got so many tweets. Why didn't you take the corner office? Like, people were very upset about that. They're gonna love you, Howard. You're so down to earth and relatable. We use the name Hamlin as a placeholder, as in Harry Hamlin from LA Law. And for the entire season, we were like, what are we gonna change this name to? And finally, Hamlin just stuck. <laughs> we kept saying Hamlin, Hamlin McGill as a joke. I don't think Howard Hamlin has anything to worry about. Uh, you know, the sun is shining on his street. And I think it's not, I think he very much feels that he's, he's earned it. Characters present themselves to you over time, over seasons, over many episodes. They gradually reveal themselves to you. Hamlin, there's still a lot to learn about him. You know, he starts off like a good foil for Jimmy and a possibly bad guy, but we, we learn a few things about him and he's not so bad after all. You've been doing all of this every day? For over a year? You'll take care of this? Absolutely. Patrick is the sweetest guy. So that, I think, his natural honesty and straightforwardness and sweetness helps inform that character. And in the end, hopefully you don't hate him because you shouldn't. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a great conflicting character. It's great. That's, I mean, that's my suit, right? The challenge, costume-wise and wardrobe-wise, for a character that's already been set the audience knows what he's going to end up looking like. So the challenge was, how does he start? And I came up with this idea that he would wear brown suits and that they would be double-breasted. And then no one else on the show, you won't even see an extra or anyone else with a double-breasted suit, and certainly not a brown one. If you watch the show and you start to see who is what, you'll see that their, their colors correspond to what side of the track they're from. Me home. I used grays and navies and blues for people who are lawyers and policemen that are very by the book, law abiding. And then those that are on the opposite side of the tracks, what I call the hustlers and the cons and the crooks and the criminals and the slick guys. And I did them in the New Mexico colors, the desert, the tans, the oranges, the reds of the sunset. So you'll see when you watch the Kettlemans, she wears a lot of orange, almost exclusively. And then Jimmy now, he's, you know, he's a little bit of both. So he's sort of like the middle. He has a moral compass. The brown 
becomes a very in intermediate color. It's neither good nor bad. Does, does a steaming pile of crap scream payday to you, huh? That esteem that Jimmy drives, uh, I have to say I was at a stoplight and I was behind a car. I just happened to notice, I happened to fixate on the badge. It was a Suzuki esteem. There's something right about the word esteem for Jimmy McGill because a lot of the show seems to revolve around what Jimmy thinks of himself. We pass that idea along to Dennis Milliken, our, our transportation uh, coordinator and, and, and transpo captain. Dennis and his guys found us a bunch of esteems. There's, our, there's Bob's, uh, or rather Jimmy's, Jimmy's car. <laughs> a piece of shit. They are not that easy to find. And the truth is, it actually is a good little car. And that crappy looking yellow esteem with the primer red rear door. And that's Tony Fanning and his art department who make it look so crappy with the fake rust painted on. But that car runs like a top. And of course, the car is in contrast to that Cadillac that we saw Saul Goodman drive on Breaking Bad. They're different, different vehicles, and he's at a different part of his life. We have a great editorial team. We've, most of us have been involved in Breaking Bad one way or another, and it's, it's a great team. We all get along well, we all communicate well, and, you know, all have the same passion for the project. Do you, that's a pretty good reaction, but yeah. do you have one where he looks even more surprised? Let's look. I love it when writers and producers are working with me. It's way more fun to get what the writer had in mind and let's work on this performance and let's work on this scene to get exactly what we want out of it. I think we need a bigger line rating for 20 million, which is, uh, mm. I think we have one. 20 million? 20 million? 20 million? 20 million? 20 million? So what are we doing? John? Oh, well, can you play three or five? Just this is three. Twenty million. This is five. Twenty million. But the million from five sounds better than a million from can three. You, can you Twenty million. Yeah. Twenty million. Good job, Ellie. Oh, well, thank you. That, that that was that was the best one yet. Good job. <laughs> it's a magic event. That's why I got into editorial in the first place, is because I love working with writers and producers, and I love working on story. And then once the once a picture cut is done, we do a sound pass on everything to sort of make everything live a little bit more. I'm gonna go online. Okay, you're cool with that? Mm-hmm. Mike's register, buzz for the lights. Mike's good night. Good night. Hi. Let me take that way down. Good night. Hi. Or is that a duck? <laughs> Were you There's... able to dig out business? Yes. Oh, yeah. That's the way. Huh. around the rim there with the poop blocks. I've always wanted to have someone, someone watching me and egging me on. Yes. <laughs> that, is some place, yeah. that is some place where I need positive reinforcement. There's so sure. many places. I think there could be just, you can just carry it around with you. <laughs> Through your life. It will coach you. it to the side exactly. of your head. Yeah, that's <laughs> a social sort of laugh. Good job, Peter. <laughs> oh, oh, you're no. a big, big boy. <laughs> right. The same recording works for yeah. all circumstances. <laughs> Both shoes on. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> that's done. Uh, ba -ba -ba, symphonic swell. Put the up with the wall. Oh, yeah. That was that they're was unpleasant. There are, dog, <laughs> there are dogs howling all over Burbank. <laughs> that was, that yeah. was unpleasant in a in, in the right way. Yes. Thing. Good job, guys. How's that how's that working for you? I like I like all of it. You good with everybody. Yeah. 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 I think it's yeah, right in the vein over. There. 
In season one of Better Call Saul, I was nervous the whole time. I'm always nervous, I'm always anxious, but my source of anxiety in season one was the, the damn name of the show is Better Call Saul. And I'm worried people aren't gonna think he's badass enough. We gotta get to Saul Goodman as quick as we can. That was my fear and my thought all through season one. And then I started to see the shows edited together and I started to hear anecdotally how people were reacting to it. And it started to dawn on me, hell, I really like Jimmy McGill. I have to say, I'm so proud of the way season one came out, the way Bob and the rest of the cast brought it to these scripts, I think is beyond my wildest dreams. I'm dying to get to Saul because he will do anything to be successful. And that is just so much fun. So I'm looking forward to writing those scenes. We could have gone home with $800,000 each, tax-free. Your point being? Why didn't we? What stopped us? I remember you saying something about doing the right thing. Now in season two, as we, as we work on it, I'm thinking, how long can we put off Jimmy McGill becoming Saul Goodman? And if he becomes Saul Goodman, is that the end of the show? I would love it to run the amount of time that it does to, to match itself right up to the beginning of Breaking Bad. I think that would be sort of TV heaven to have that work out. Partner track, what are you talking about? I'm talking about there's an office in Santa Fe with your name on it, or there could be. I wanna know, what happened to Chuck? What happened to Kim? Uh, that's one of the questions. We don't, we don't see these characters on Breaking Bad, so where are they in the future? I'm a little bit worried about it, frankly. I just hope that America doesn't demand my lynching and that I get to do a few of them this, this year. Gee, I hope that season two surprises the hell out of me. In becoming Saul Goodman, Jimmy has some success and some fun. How is the one guy gonna turn into the other? I, I feel like I had a better sense of how Walter White was gonna turn into Heisenberg than I do when it comes to how is Jamie McGill gonna turn into Saul Goodman, and it scares me. But fear is a good thing, it's a motivation, it keeps you moving, and hopefully we will figure these things out. I know what stopped me, and you know what? It's never stopping me again.